Hey guys, welcome to the MarkCast. Reed here. Well, here we go. As teased, as promised, big time episode coming your way today. Hope you guys are excited. Hope you feel like I delivered on this one. Three big interviews. We have Daryl Moose Johnston coming on, Executive Vice President of Football Operations over at the UFL. We have Coach Jonathan Heimbach with the Arlington Renegades, and then Anthony Miller from Sports Illustrated. Should be a good one. Just a couple quick plugs for me here, and then we'll get to the content. I know everybody is excited. This will be the last show we do before the UFL kickoff next weekend. So no Friday episode. We'll be live Saturday, March 30th. From Arlington, we'll have a big guest list. I'll post the event page and the guest list and all of this that this week. But like and subscribe if you're excited for that. Should be a fun one. As a reminder, we're going to be giving away two tickets to the UFL championship game if we cross that 3,500 subscriber mark. So like and subscribe if you appreciate the work today, if you're excited for the kickoff next weekend. And then we'll be doing not only the, the we'll do our Friday shows kind of during the UFL season, but then we'll also be doing weekly recaps on Mondays uh, following the games, kind of talking about you know the games and the standings and what did we learn and what, what's it, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong, kind of all that stuff. So getting that all workshopped and set up. But we did that last year with the XFL and with the USFL and then even the CFL. So continuing that in some form, but subscribe, like the video if you're excited for that because should have lots of UFL content coming out here. And I know we're getting back to the CFL. had lots of questions about that, but kind of focusing, let's get this league kicked off and then we'll move towards all of that stuff here and start balancing it out a little more. So uh, like I said, Daryl Johnston, great interview, talking everything you would want Daryl Johnston to talk about, You know, kind of his future vision for the league, the XFL, USFL, kind of how did those negotiations go with the merger and the kind of the politics behind that. We're talking the XFL kickoff, the rules, kind of all that stuff. So means a lot, especially the league setting that up. Daryl taking the time to come on. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Coach Jonathan Heimbach coming on, taking time on a Sunday. Uh, Coach Heimbach is in an interesting situation where he was with the Birmingham Stallions back in 2022, won the championship. Then he was with the XFL Renegades last year, won the championship that way. And so now this is kind of the, the Coach Heimbach invitational here for the kickoff with the Stallions coming, you know, with the Renegades hosting the Stallions in Choctaw. So lots of interesting comments uh, from Coach Heimbach getting ready for the season. And what's it like? Kind of all these familiar faces coming back around and his thoughts heading into this season. Uh, we chatted with him twice last year uh, during the season and then uh, after his championship win. So uh, it should be a good interview that way. And then uh, Anthony Miller coming on, busiest man in the spring football here with Sports Illustrated covering all of the UFL stuff. We'll be chatting. Uh, final roster cuts are coming out for some of the teams, getting Anthony's thoughts on training camp and the season and kind of previewing all of that stuff. So Three big interviews. I appreciate everybody all the time. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. Uh, like and subscribe. We'll see you at the end. Thanks. Well, here we go. This is exciting. Many emails getting ready for this. We have the executive vice president, football operations here, Daryl Johnson with UFL. Now I wore... I did have to wear my Washington Commanders hat today. I had to make a stand, but maybe we could pretend it's the AAF Commanders, if that makes you feel better. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. No, uh, uh, Dan Quinn is one of my favorite people in the world. So it, it it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, big. Yeah, big offseason here for that. That could be a whole different conversation about all that. Uh, I, I say this, you know, we're kind of week three, getting into week four, training camp here. Welfare check for you, kind of how is everything going? It's been really good. You know, I, I think obviously it's not been perfect. You know, we've had some some bumps in the road, but I think the big thing is, uh, you know, overall, when we looked at it, it's it's, it's us trying to hold ourselves to that that high standard. So uh, this week we finally got a little bit of downtime and we were able to kind of circle back and go through the onboarding process. You know, where, where could we have been a little bit better? Uh, get to that car wash component where we create all the production elements that will be there uh, as part of the broadcast and in studio. And where can we get better there? Offboarding, you know, we cut 136 players um, on, uh, on the 16th, um, 17th. So, you know, I think the big thing there was just kind of that that travel component, the timing. Um, where's a good time to start? So, you know, where can we get better there? So that that's been really kind of us being a little bit picky, but everything being taken into consideration, you know, Russ always tells us, you know, we're we're I think on day 62 or 63 of actually being an official league. So where we are now and, and what we've done through that process, 
Um, you know, everybody take a lot of pride in what you're doing. So, but it, it's been great to watch everybody still hold that high standard uh, as we're working and moving along. But, but training camp itself, the players, I think that that was one of the big things. We heard it from the coaches how hard it was to cut from 75 down to 58. We heard it from the players where when you walked onto the field and it was 58 guys in the USFL, you could kind of look at the landscape and go, I'm going to be good. I'm going to make the 50. This year, it's 75. Hearing the guys talking about the first couple of days of practice and looking around and watching the guys and then saying this is going to be a very competitive two weeks you know, to get that roster spot. So um, I, I think that the hard part about doing the merger when you talk about the loss of the players that were going to be a part of the league moving forward, the coaches that were going to be a part of the league moving forward, our, our first test has really shown that, that we, we really did upgrade the level of talent you know, across the league. And, and I still feel like 58 to 50 is going to be challenging. It's, it's, it's going to be even that, that finer part. And, and it's, I think it's going to be fun for us to see the coaches, um, you know, kind of that back end of the roster, because this is going to be, you know, the guys that are adding depth and creating special team spots. I, I, I feel very confident that everybody's, you know, they've got their two deep, just like the NFLs as you're kind of winding down and getting ready to start that season opener. So where are those hard decisions now made on that, that backup depth and, and how important they are in the special teams component of the game? Is that kind of your selling point, I guess, for you know going into this merger ride? And there's a lot of fan bases. I'm I'm in Seattle here, you know. Obviously, a lot of these uh, is the selling point because it shouldn't be one plus one is two, right? With the XFL and the USFL, it should be okay. We're getting these fan bases, and then also new fans. Is it that elevated, you know, level of football? You know, we don't have the player fifty four brand. Like, what is your selling point in your mind of this new merged league? Yeah, that's great that you just said that. You know, we, we talk about one plus one equals 3.5. You know, we need to be able to do that. It, it has to be an elevated uh, expectation from us at the, at the top and to start those conversations so it flows down throughout the organization, throughout the league. Um, so that's that's definitely one of the bigger parts there uh, as, as we're going through this. I, I think one of the things that, that we've started to have conversations is what, what do we want our new messaging to be? You know, what we, we do want to kind of move off of the developmental component. We want to get away from the opportunity component. We want to talk about the talent of the players that are in this league. We want to talk about the sustainability of spring football now that these two leagues have joined together and, and have elevated the talent that we're going to see. You know, going to all the various town halls during the course of uh, the buildup to the season, you know, we talked about the level of talent in this league being the best since you had Reggie White. Jim Kelly, Herschel Walker, Mike Rozier, Steve Young, you know, back in the day when spring football was trying to go head to head with the NFL and, and paying big contracts to get that talent there. This is going to be the first time that you're going to see, you know, that that type of talent. I'm not saying we've got Hall of Famers on our rosters right now, but spring football that you have seen in other iterations um, th this will be the best talent that if you're a fan of spring football, you will have seen uh, in, 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 in recent history. I know you said, you know, a rush job here, right? Just with all the circumstances this season, kind of getting in, in your mind, what would off season look like, you know, next year, or what, what would be kind of the ideal in terms of getting the marketing and everything in place? Cause I think we are kind of getting through the best we can right now. Yeah. I, I think the big thing is, is just getting our calendar set um, getting venue availability set, um, being able to get our schedule set. That allows us to release ticket sales earlier. Uh, you know, that, that's been one of the harder things. I, I think single-game single, single game tickets went on, site, went on sale in Detroit five days ago. Yeah. Um, so it, it has been challenging. So just having all the elements that we can control next year going into the offseason and making sure that we are, we are checking boxes as soon as we possibly can so we can lighten that burden on the back end of it. And, and one of the hardest things was venue availability um, and scheduling, you know, coming down to the wire this year, you know, based on, on, on how we were going to pull this off. So that, that's something that we'll be way ahead of the curve with that way we can start to, to talk to our fans uh, about what, what the, the games are going to be, uh, you know, in market, uh, so just being ahead of that is, is going to be a tremendous help. And I, it's one of those things that I'm sure a lot of people don't think about. Um, you know, we, we get focused on the football, but all those moving parts that that are really kind of driving a lot of the revenue components uh, was was really late coming on board this year. And we've got to be much, much further ahead down the road, uh, not only for us, but but also for our fans so they can start to plan. Are we happy with the March 30th? Is that a stopgap this season? How do we feel about that? 
I think that that's another one of the big items that'll be up for discussion. Um, you know, I, I think it was a, a necessity this year, um, you know, to push it back a little bit. We didn't want to get it too far back. We were always talking about trying to find that happy medium in between legacy XFL and legacy USFL when you talk about start dates. Um, you know, this kind of slotted that. We're still having conversations about some of those iconic sports events that we would be in direct competition with, depending on the start date. You know, how do we feel about going up against the NCAA tournament when that goes into full swing? How do we feel about being, uh, you know, on the same weekend as the Masters? So there's some things there that we have to talk about. But again, with the trust and the belief in the league and then the support from the fans and the viewers, that really helps us to have some honest conversations there. And just growing up as a league and being able to do some things regionally that we had to do this year just based on the timing of the schedule that we just talked about, that that makes us a little bit more mature moving forward. Can we stay off the busy day of the NCAA tournament on a Saturday and a Sunday because we can regionalize games and maybe steal some windows in there? It's really that first weekend that, that really is the one that's going to be hard to compete against because the games are on almost all day long. But OK, so that's going to be a challenge for us. How do we do our best job there? But those other weekends, do we feel like now with some open windows that we could we could regionalize some things and have current games going on at the same time? Um, so there's some things that just as we develop and stay ahead of the curve. Uh, and I think we can navigate the Masters as well. Um, you know, there's some things there that we could do. So I, I think is as, as we start to become um a league that has the trust of its fan base and, and kind of locks them in from a viewership standpoint that they'll come find where we are, that they'll make time to sit down and watch. Um, you know, I think that that opens the discussion to be a little bit more flexible when, when we want that start date to be on the calendar. You talked about that legacy XFL and legacy USFL. Obviously, you know, you've been around kind of both, you know, past. And I've even had, a, I'm sure your good friend Coach Heimbach on here this week as well, talking and someone that's been on both sides. How was kind of that marrying of the ideas? Because I want to talk about the rules here too briefly. But, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of both leagues held dear. And obviously, you know, a little bit of shots taken back and forth. So how was kind of this marrying of the two ideas? Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, we're, we're all competitors. So, you know, we all had, uh, you know, the beliefs. Um, you know, in what our league had done well, and, and they had their beliefs in what they had done well. And that was going to be the biggest challenge. You know, can we check our egos at the door and really follow what we've been talking about, which is let's make sure we get the best practices in line with the UFL and not let our egos get in the way. Um, so that was something I think we did a really good job of. I mean, there were some things that we that we admired, that we liked that the XFL did and, and talking with Russ Brandon and Doug Whaley and, and Russ Gillio, there were some things that, you know, that we had done in the USFL that they liked and thought that we executed very well. So when, when you can have those open conversations, it, it makes things a lot easier. And we probably had two or three that were kind of the sticky ones. Um, and it was really kind of like you would do in politics. I mean, you've got to bring people from the other side of the aisle to your side and see the value in doing what you're doing. So, you know, on those items, it, it, it was a little bit more of a sell. Um, and but again, staying in that posture of, listen, you know, what what is best for the league moving forward? Uh, and, and I think we were able to do a really, really good job there. Um, and, and as you talk about the rules, you know, that that was one of the areas, you know, where we can give you some concrete examples of that. Well, yeah, and just, you know, when I, because I was talking with people, I said, hey, you know, I think we're going to get Daryl Johnson out here. They said, you got to ask about, because the kickoff rule here, and obviously you were part of both, uh, I think the comments of it not looking like real football might have uh, upset some of the XFL fans, especially considering maybe the NFL adopting it here in the future. Uh, what w Was that really the sticking point? Do you have any clarifications on those comments? Because I think that was, I think it upset some kind of XFL, like OG homers, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I ever said it. it I, I said it. We wanted a more traditional look. I, I did never. I, I don't think I ever said it doesn't look like real football. If I did, that that was not my intent. I, I I would never disparage anybody. I think what we talked about is it looked more like traditional football, which we wanted. We wanted movement at the kick, um, and and for us that wasn't that was not the selling point. That was not the huge one. The biggest thing for us is is really looking at. You know, what do special teams provide for our players? We can have a Cavante Turpin story. We can have a Brandon Aubrey story. But there's a lot of other stories there where it's the third tight end. It's the fourth safety. It's the fifth corner that makes an NFL roster because they've had an opportunity to see how effective he is 
on special teams as a cover guy and as a blocker or a return guy. So that was one of the big things that we wanted to, to take into consideration and bring to the table from the USFL side when we talked about the kickoff. The number one item in this whole conversation is player health and safety. So the returns were almost identical when we talked about the numbers. They were both right around 91.4, 91.3%. When we looked at the medical data, the medical data was on par as well. There was not a significant increase um, in any types of injuries with the legacy USFL style compared to the legacy XFL style. So that is that is the most important element that we want to look at. And then we also want to look at what what is the best opportunity for our players to, to get noticed, to be seen and have that opportunity to get to the NFL. So we kind of went that direction. Now, with all this conversation about the NFL potentially adopting what the XFL did, you know, that that, that does change things. Um, but but what we will do is we will continue to move forward with the plan that we had in place. And if at any point, if, if injuries start to become an issue on our style kickoff, we will make a change. And, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that, that we've demonstrated um, from legacy USFL. We, we had other situations during the course of our first two years where there were issues. And, and we're not, we, again, you know, check your ego at the door. You know, we, we tried something. It didn't work. Let's move off of it. We listen to the input from our players all the time. So we, we want to be stewards of the game that do it the right way. Sometimes we make a decision and it may not be the right one, but but this was something that, that we felt was very important. Um, there were other ones that that the XFL felt was very important and and we, we steered their way. Um, but I know that this was the big one and there was a lot of people talking about it. And, and quite honestly, when you look at our league, we have four head coaches that want to know why we're doing it this way and four head coaches that are fine that we're doing it this way. So there are still some attachments um, from your previous leagues. That, and that's going to be stuff that we that we navigate through the course of season one here in the UFL. Uh, but the, the biggest thing I want to get out there is I, if, if I said it doesn't look like real football, I apologize. I never meant to to disparage, you know, that, that style of kickoff. What we what I thought I said and what I hope I did was more traditional. We want it to look like a more traditional kickoff with movement at the time of the kick. So that was that was from an aesthetic point and a viewership point. But the most important thing is we can't even have that conversation if our medical data is not similar to what the XFL's medical data was. Uh, two questions here. I know we're kind of, you hopped on there early. I don't want to keep you too long here. I appreciate your time. In terms of, you were talking about that, the four coaches transitioning and how has that gone with, we had Curtis Johnson on last week with the Roughnecks now and transitioning to you know, the USFL, uh, you know, adopting kind of the XFL branding with that and trying to build the fan base there in Houston. Uh, how do you think that that's gone, that transition to kind of have the four and four? Yeah, that that was one of our kind of unique situations um, is is the Houston market. And and I think that that's probably one of our best examples, because that really comes down to, you know, a team that's going to have a lot of change. Um, you know, the Roughnecks moniker um, is, is something that I think resonates a little bit more when you talk about, you know, what you know, this, the, the city of Houston and the surrounding area and, and what the oil industry has has meant to that community. Uh, I think there's a better connection there. Uh, so we really felt that that it would it would be good to go with the Roughnecks as opposed to the gamblers. Um, and then we wanted to make sure that there was balance in, in, in how we were bringing in staff. So it was really, OK, Curtis, you're, you're going to have your staff, your roster in place as you move forward. But we're going to bring the XFL moniker and color scheme over to you. Uh, and, and it's been fantastic. And my my happiest moment this year is going to be on the 31st. It's going to be great to kick off, uh, you know, on on opening day with Birmingham versus Arlington as our two champions from from last season go head to head. But for me, I'm going to be down in Houston uh, because Houston gets to play in a home market for the first time. Uh, and, and that's something that I'm really, really excited about. All of our other teams have been able to do that. We were in Birmingham. We were in Memphis. We were in Detroit. Houston was the the, the lone survivor from the merger that never got an opportunity to play in front of their home market. So I'm really, really excited for Curtis Johnson and his staff and his players to finally have a true home game. They were playing in Birmingham in year one. They were playing in Memphis in year two. This is going to be their first opportunity. So uh, I'm really excited about that. And I think that that creates a great example. I was at the town hall, um, you know, earlier this year uh, in Houston, and and there's a tremendous amount of support there. 
they're just happy that they made the merger and that they're going to have football in the spring in the city of Houston. Uh, last one for me here. I, this is near and dear to kind of a lot of different, uh, the online fantasy sports betters, kind of all that stuff. In terms of injury reports this year and trying to kind of broaden that fan base to get people to do that, do you know how the league's going to be handling that? I know the XFL would kind of send them out. USFL was not as uh, uh, transparent about it. And I know there's various uh, you know methodology behind that. But do you guys know about that and trying to be able to make sure that people are informed so that they can follow in bed and do all the fantasy stuff? I think we were very transparent in the USFL. I, I think we just followed probably a more rigid NFL style of release. Um, so, you know, the one thing that we've talked about, you know, during the course of, of the merger, when it's about information that's going out, the most important thing is the information is correct. It's not about who gets it out there first. So yeah. the, the number one thing is the accuracy. And if we are going to have gambling, then that accuracy has to be spot on. And and so we just we followed a more traditional you know NFL style model when you talked about the, the injury reporting on the daily reports, um, you know, when we get 48 hours, um, you know, who's active, who's inactive, um, you know, we'll have some of the mechanisms that we had uh, in the legacy UFL uh, to make changes there um, within 90 minutes, within 30 minutes, because we actually had a 30 minute change that we, uh, that we uh, enacted, I think in year one in the USFL. And that was something that Jim pop brought to the table that I, I never thought was going to happen. And then all of a sudden it does. So, um, you know, I, I felt that we were transparent last year. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, we were a little bit protective, but but I don't think we ever tried to hide anything. I think we really tried to try to stay to the NFL timelines when you get into the game day status report and then the active inactive report uh, as we're leading up to the game. We, we know how important that information is um, to the sports betting fan community. Um, so we know we have to be spot on. And that's why we challenged everybody. You know how important this this information is to be kept, you know, close to the vest within the league until it's supposed to be released. So you'll probably see something that's more USFL than you saw from XFL last year. Uh, but that's not to hide anything. That's not a lack of transparency. That's really just our mission to make sure anything that comes out that's sensitive like that is is 100 accurate when we release that from the league. Perfect. I just, yeah, I know that's, I always want to make sure I ask that when you get people on, because I know that's very important. So Daryl, I really appreciate it. I know it's crazy busy. Thank you for taking the time today and copping on early even. So appreciate it. You got it. No problem. Enjoy the conversation. Well, the last time, last couple of times we've had Coach Heimbach on, I think the first time was the most viewed episode I think we had had ever for a single guest coming on. And then last time, I know we went viral for talking about the XFL Championship Trophy being able to uh, be flipped upside down and drank out of. So uh, lots of high expectations today. Coach Heimbach, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for bringing up some good memories. It's good. This is exciting. Back again now. Again, first off, uh, what we're three weeks into training camp. Kind of how is life for you here? Welfare check. Uh, it's going well. It's a little bit of Groundhog's Day. Um, every day in training camp, it seems to be the same routine. But, you know, the guys have been great. Um, the guys on this team that Rick Mueller's put together on this roster, um, every single day they come in. They're ready to learn. They're ready to put uh, good things on tape and really improve their craft. So um, I, I was just talking to a couple guys around the league. I think we only have right now one returning player on the offensive line from last year's championship team. So that just speaks to the volume of how good the talent is right now and um, just how this league is continuing to evolve. In terms of uh, kind of getting ready, we had scrimmages, right? I know we had open practice here and, and fans coming. Uh, how do you feel like the guys are acclimating here and, and how is kind of the team chemistry coming together? It's a little bit different of a field this season uh, because we've had the opportunity to get together with some other teams. We've seen, we've had three different occasions. Two times we've done an organized practice with the Houston uh, Roughnecks. Uh, which has been great. Um, know a lot of their coaches and have the utmost respect for them. And they came in and it was a very business-like uh, type of a feel at the stadium. And I think they wanted to be in the stadium with us. It was great to be at Choctaw, um, just moving the ball up and down the field and doing some situational work. And then we get a chance to go against Memphis and kind of a organized practice over at Mansfield. So it's been good. It's kind of broken up the monotony of training camp. 
in terms of you know obviously being with the usfl here you know and, and whatever and then, and then coming back over uh thoughts here on kind of all this coming together here would you have ever expected kind of to be in this situation now and uh, facing birmingham the first week i mean kind of a really weird situation to be at what do you make of kind of this merged premier spring football league now it's all come full circle i mean there's so many familiar faces for me um, in my career, I've spent a lot of time north of the border in the Canadian Football League. And to look over across the sideline and see a guy like Jim Pop, who I've had, um, you know, we've uh, celebrated some great cup championship wins uh, together in Montreal and, and Toronto together. And and to see him at, as part of the, the brass with the league is, is great. And then also to see uh, Moose Johnson, uh, who he and I were together in the AAF back in the day with the San Antonio Commanders um, and with his vision for the league. And then yesterday I walked into Choctaw Stadium with Skip Holtz. And so it's really neat. Everybody just loves to be a part of something. I think we've got the right pieces to the puzzle, being able to put this league together. Uh, it was hard. It was a little bit difficult, I'll be honest, when the league kind of, we didn't really know where we stood. And our contracts ran out all of a sudden there's talk of a merger. We didn't know which teams would make it. And I'm very fortunate, very blessed to be a part of Bob's staff again. Uh, but to see those guys across the sideline and in the league, uh, just builds the excitement and appreciation to be a part of this. Yeah. What's it like having Daryl kind of in charge of football ops again here? And you know, obviously you've had you know lots of experience with him, but now it, it, different feelings here in camp now, or how is that going? Well, the one thing I'll always say about Moose is, is he's a guy that's not afraid to roll up his sleeves. I remember when we were together in the, uh, the USFL a few years ago when I was with Birmingham, I would see Moose, he, you know, everybody sees him as on TV, the executive, the ex-player, those type of things, doing the commentating. But he's rolling up his sleeves, loading Gatorade onto the bus for players to go, you know, have an off-site practice. I mean, he's boots on the ground. He's a guy that... I think football people respect. I know the coaches appreciate his insight. Uh, it's great to see him just on an occasion. I know we're both running around with us game planning and practice, and he's got a million things going on. But uh, true appreciation and, and excitement about where these things are going right now. In terms of Arlington, with Chuck now kind of running as OC, difference as for the offense or things you're noticing, different changes there? Well, there's always change. You're, there's going to be change based on your roster. I mean, we have a lot of new fresh faces. Um, obviously, guys like Luis Perez and, you know, Davion Smith and, you know, um, Tyler Vaughn, some of those guys were staples for us last year. Um, but we've got new guys coming in with new skills. And so the offense is going to change and more. We're going to try to get the ball in guys' hands and let them – uh, you know, let him create, let him put good things on tape. I've worked with Chuck before, so very blessed uh, to be with him. He was the head coach at San Diego State when I was working with him. So good to be reunited again. And and now we've got a background uh, for what our players can handle. Last year, I don't think we really knew what we had. Um, we threw the – we kind of threw a playbook at him and saw what stuck. And as people watch this league, those are truly familiar with the league. So how much offense change, how much defense has changed? Because you, you kind of introduce concepts and you see what your players can handle. And the guys really took took on a great role in putting this offense together. So it's been fun to see year two now uh, picking the ball up and running with it. And it's been fun just to uh, see the new guys really elevate because the older guys, they're forcing the tempo. They're really, you know, Luis has been a great leader a great example for the guys. Uh, so we've really been pushing them hard. And I heard one of the guys say, this is the biggest install they've ever had, even in NFL training camps. And we've got a lot of offense in, and now it's our job as coaches to peel it back and make a real concise game plan as we go into week one and figure out who we are. Is it harder building an offensive line now with a couple fewer roster spots than there were? I know that there are some changes here going into the season. Yeah, le uh, less numbers is a little bit more difficult. When we were in the USFL two years ago, had about the same numbers then. So it was uh, a luxury a year ago to have some more bodies in the room. Um, but it, more is not always 
better. And, and, you know, I say that with, with a little bit of reservations, just because you want to have more time to evaluate players. But I think the quality of player is much better this year. Look at the additions we put into, uh, you know, just into our roster. And I'm looking around at the other groups. It's a really seasoned veteran group and not guys that are, you know, multiple spring spring league players it's guys with lots of quality starting nfl experience and so that's exciting to see the background guys have and the professionalism that walks in the door every day one of the big conversation points we had when you were on before was the start of the season right and obviously this year there was a lot you know we're we're, we're starting a little later here and i think kind of everyone understands why but thoughts on that which is the march 30th do you like that is that still enough time because i know that was a big selling point for you with the xfl was the earlier start yeah i think uh you know it's one of those things you just deal with the schedule i think hopefully now with us being on major national broadcast is going to be helpful for the league but you know, for us, I mean, we're so much further along year two than year one. Um, I, I don't know that our camp was any shorter. It's just a little later in the year. And and I think it gave guys a little bit more of a chance to figure out, are they going to sign an NFL futures deal or are they going to come play and get actual film? And I think that's maybe the appeal. Sure, a little bit later, we're backed up to NFL training camps and maybe they miss some OTAs. Uh, but I mean, players are players and if you play well, you're going to get noticed. And so, uh, we hope to be able to allow guys to prolong their professional career and whether it be with us or somebody else or having the opportunity down the road. Um, you know, I think player wise, they probably wanted an earlier start, but for us coaches, we're ready to go and, and, you know, we're chomping at the bit to get this first game started. Uh, in terms of kind of XFL before, it was a lot of player 54 ride and recognizing the opportunity and a lot with DJ and all of that. This year, we're, we don't, we're like, we're the Premier League, we're the Premier Spring Football League. We're, we're, you've been around so many of these. What would you like to see kind of this new UFL's identity be? Because it, it's still, I mean, and again, we're kind of rushed here head up this season, but it feels like we're still kind of trying to figure out what we want that latch on to. Yeah, I think just putting good quality content on TV and giving these guys a chance to show their skills. Um, I think with having a small group of returning players is good um, and familiarity with our staff. And we've had, obviously, continuity in our coaching staff. Everybody that is with us currently was on the coaching staff last year. A little bit harder because we have a smaller staff size now, so there's a little bit more responsibility on each coach. Um and just with the staff size, uh, that's probably one of the biggest issues that we've had to deal with is smaller staffs. And now we've gone to just seasonal pay with coaches. And so that makes it a little bit more difficult maybe for retaining coaches down the road. Uh, but I think the identity of the league, I think people will see a much improved product, maybe a little bit more polished like it was towards the end of the season last year. Uh, with the returning players and continuity and coaching staffs. I think all those things uh, definitely play out. But you need new players every single year. You, you don't want guys that are, you know, five-year spring football veterans. I mean, you want to wish them the best. I had two of my favorites, uh, Brian Folkerts and Mike Horton, who played for us last year, and both of them are moving on to different phases of their life. Brian's coaching right now, and Mike's just the new dad, so it's exciting to to have a small part of those guys' professional football career, and uh, looking forward to seeing what this this new group uh, can put on TV here shortly. Uh, what does it feel like the expectations are with the league here now for in terms of growth coming out of this, and obviously without the competition, it, it's a little more. But obviously, there's this immediacy where we still need to kind of make a mark. Have they kind of have you got a sense of kind of what the expectations are? They're hoping to hit. Uh, you know, that that's above my pay grade. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those where we just – I try to put together the best offensive line and give these guys a chance uh, to be successful and, and put an offensive game plan together that is going to, you know, make our fans proud. And so, you know, as far as beyond that, for the, the large scope of the league, uh, you know, I think I'm going to stay in my lane and do my thing and, and enjoy coaching this unit, this group. Um, you know, I just wanted to – throw it a shout out to Rick Mueller, our, our general manager. He's done an incredible job of finding talent, finding players, creating competition in camp. And so I think the fans are going to like what they see. 
um, not just early on, but uh, throughout the full season. Uh, in terms of coaching staff, here, I'll let you go here. Over here, I see the time. Um, lots of shuffling, and everything. When you look over at Birmingham, uh, you know a lot of similar faces there. Is that have they kind of set the standard in terms of what your uh, you know, expectations are for a spring football team, and, and how challenging is that going to be to kind of come in and see them here uh, opening week? I think it's just day by day. You know, Skip's done a phenomenal job with his staff. Um, a lot of guys returned back from uh, our coaching staff two years ago. Um, so I know Bill Johnson and, and, and Corey are back over there with Coach Chavis, with John. So uh, great continuity on their staff, but same thing with ours. Bob is a great one to work for, um, you know, really empowers his coaches, let us put a game plan together. And it's, it's fun to come to work every single day. And when, you know, really there's only been one real run in with, with Birmingham, um, you know, our very first walkthrough, we look up and there's like 15 of their guys sitting there watching our practice at Choctaw. And I don't think they even really realized what they were doing. Other than that, like we really haven't seen Birmingham. Uh, they practice in the afternoons. We're in the mornings. We're both super busy. We need to take care of our own teams rather than worrying about the other guys. And, you know, we'll see them in a couple weeks. And uh, it's a uh, it's really a unique setup that we have sharing a practice facility um, and appreciate what the league has done and given us a chance to, you know, showcase what we can do out there. Uh, last thing for me, I know that, you know, and obviously coaching and kind of above all this, but we, we've set up this dynamic, right, of the XFL conference versus the USFL conference, right? And we're leaning into the, you know, the kickoff game and all that stuff. Uh, we were talking with Darius Victor, like, is there any sense of rivalry between that? You view that, and obviously you've been on both sides of the war field here, but uh, is there a sense there of pride of that, or is it just these eight teams? I'm curious how you view that as a coach. Yeah, I mean, I've been on both sides. Um, I've been a veteran of spring football leagues and, and love this climate. Um, you're working with professionals and guys that are really trying to make a livelihood. And, uh, you know, for us as coaches doing the same thing also, um, sure. There's always competition. You want to win. This is professional football. That's what it is. Um, but there's a common respect, uh, all the way across the board, um, for the coaches, for the players, for what everybody is, is putting on the line and uh, the hours and, and uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that's put into this thing. So, um, sure, it's going to be a great rivalry. Um, I think it's going to be good football. I think people are going to like what they see, and it gives the fans a little bit of a, uh, an excitement to, to get their home teams back playing in all the markets. I think that's great. Um, we're excited to be here five of the uh five of the home games and we only have to travel for five like everybody else has got to travel for every single one even if they're home games so we're looking forward to it and uh, uh excited to see the fans out here for the opener it's going to be a great start to the season uh, well i'll be down there i appreciate it thanks for making the time today on the sunday it means a lot so i appreciate it thanks reed see you man Well, I spent a good five minutes here trying to figure out which commander's hat I wanted to wear to best, uh, to best troll Anthony Miller here. But if I wear a commander's hat to troll the executive vice president of football operations for the UFL, I can also do the same for you. So we have Anthony Miller here. Really nice because we like we a lot of shots back and forth in private DMs. It's good to be on here. and We'll be professional and polite today. I really appreciate it. How are you, sir? I am doing good. You know, uh, my condolences on Caleb Williams going to bear down instead of take command. But, you know, it's been good. I'm doing good. I, I you know, I, I read these scouting reports and we'll see, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. every day I kind of go back and forth. of like, I'm either heartbroken or not. Uh, so Anthony uh, in Arlington here, he's going to join us next week. We're doing our UFL show, had a chance to go to scrimmages last weekend. has been a part of a lot of the media calls with the coaches and writing articles for Sports Illustrated. I have your one here talking about the Arlington cuts today. So timeline wise, final cuts are due Saturday. Some of the teams are rolling them out now. Uh, how are you? I guess I always just ask top welfare check kind of we're a week from kickoff. Like, how are we feeling? It's it's just a different feeling than it's been in other years, because I, I feel like there's. If, I feel like every year that we're covering these leagues, there's more uncertainty because you just don't know if you're going to get to the next year. Because it's like, okay, the XFL lasted in 20, well, at least this version of the XFL is 2020 and 2023. USFL was 22 and 23. And it's like, okay, we've done a couple years of this. Like, you're, you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, when when is this actually going to just 
flop and I don't want it to like I, I I'd love for this league to work but you know it, there's just so much uncertainty but like how is this year going to go you know I'm really interested to see what what the attendance is going to be like what are the ratings going to be like I mean it, it, there there's going to be a lot more games on national television which is great you know with with Fox kind of taking about half of the games on their network but there's just so much uncertainty that you know, I, I just kind of, I'm playing a wait and see thing. It's going to be a week by week thing. Like, let's see what happens in week one. Let's see what happens in week two. You know, let's see if, if the leak and, you know, there's going to be a dip in some capacity when it comes down to attendance and ratings. It's just a matter of, you know, is it going to be a small percentage? If it's a small percentage, then I think it's a success. If it, if it's a big drop, like, you know, 40, 50% for both, you know, throughout the year, then I think there's going to be a lot of concern about next year. So I know like everyone loves talking about expansion. I get that's all we hear every week is everyone like, Oh, we're going to expand the 12 teams. We're going to expand it. Like, no, let's just, let's get through this year. Let's see if we can make a profit. And then, you know, maybe two, three years down the road, let, then we can maybe add two more teams. But I just want to be, I just want to see this league be profitable with the eight teams they have now. Yeah, I almost kind of did a rant on this podcast because I've recorded everything else. And I decided not to just because, um, you know, kind of keep a professional with Daryl and everyone on here. But um, yeah, you know, obviously that's like the hot button thing. I don't, to me, uh, save for the expansion talk, I don't sense a lot of hotness right now about this, right? I think the Larry David on Rich Eisen today complaining about the goalposts and going to the rock about it is probably the most I've seen about this league in, in weeks, it feels like. And like I said, we're, you know, we're eight days from kickoff here. You know, we'll be in Arlington uh, a week from, you know, a week from when this episode airs. So that's where I, I am concerned opening game. I, I'm very concerned. I need to look at ticket sales and how the maps are going, but I, I'm a little worry wart. Yeah. So I, I was, look, people love nostalgia. So like when the XFL came back in 2020, I think everyone was super excited because like, you know, what kind of XFL we're going to, it's been 20 years since this happened. So everybody was watching. The ratings were really good. The attendance was good. You know, everyone was excited to see it. You know, USFL in 2022, I think people were, were excited. It's like, it's been 30, 40 years since this league has come. But now that we've gone through it over the last couple of years, I think people are just, I, I hate to say, like, they're starting to lose, you know, patience and they're, they're like i don't really know if i believe in this thing anymore i mean these leagues aren't making any progress in fact they merge and they cut half of their teams so it's kind of a you know for for the casual football fan it's like you know why should i be engaged with it it seems like these you know teams are coming and going all the time it's like why why would i be attached to them so i mean it, yeah I, I agree with you i don't think there's been enough attention on this that we've seen in the past there was a lot of excitement with the xfl over the last few years there was more excitement with the usfl in the last couple of years the ufl is just kind of like you know that they, they, they put this thing together in two three months and you know just hoping that there's going to get a lot of attention they need to do a lot more in the next week on you know advertising and getting out on these espn shows and fox shows to really push for this product because Right now, I just don't, I agree with you, I don't really see enough of it. And I've been looking at, you know, Ticketmaster and seeing the seats and, you know, for like Arlington and, you know, at least for Arlington, I've seen there, there's still a lot of open seats. Yeah. I mean, there's there's thousands of seats that are still open. You know, even for St. Louis, I, I still think there's a ton of seats that are still open to be, you know, bought. So I, I'm really interested to see what, you know, if they can turn it around in the next week and get a lot of people in the stands. That'd be great. But um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm trying to be a little cautious this time around and kind of see how this thing goes week by week. Yeah. I think that's how a lot of people feel. I know Greg Parks has been on. I always kind of judge a, um, and it will talk, talk real football here too. If people are listening, you know, I want to kind of, I always like to set the stage here with some of this stuff. Uh, I, I judge looking at other people's content as well as my own, right. Is there an upswing in YouTube views? Um, you know, people are, are, are they searching that? I don't feel that. Uh, and I always kind of judge if I get asked by a lot of like CFL people like to come on their shows, like the Rod Petersons of the world. I did one podcast this week with my friend with third down gamble, uh, one of the CFL guys, but like, you know, normally the last couple of years, you go, Hey Reed, like, tell me about this USFL thing. Hey Reed, tell me about all that stuff. I will say Daryl in his interview, I think was very transparent about, Hey, we're doing the best we can right now. We're late to the game. It's, we're trying to build all this in two months. You know, this is right. This is the situation we are in, and we really need to stop down going into next year, which is great. The, the concern is always like, well, what if there is no next year? You know, that was why I was so upset about the merch when the merch came out, and people said, well, you got to give them time. 
the one thing then that this that has its time. So I think they're aware that this is not the ideal timeline that they are in, but also like you could have played this season out or that. I mean, there was a myriad of things they could have done to get to here, but I do think they're at least aware of like, we're trying to do the best we can right now. So that, that, that makes me a little more, uh, that gives me more encouragement to hear that if they, if they, if they're self-aware, like, okay, we know this, this year may not be the smoothest. It may not be the best experience, but let's at least get it something out on television and let's show, you know, the players are going to shell out at the end of the day. Like, as long as we give the players enough time to go through training camp and stuff like that, like the players are going to ball out. Maybe, maybe it may not be the best presentation. Maybe the fan experience may not be as great as we want it to be, but Hey, at least these players are going to go out. They're going to put a good television product and maybe we can start building for next year so I, i'm at least glad that they're you know that daryl was you know open about that because that i think a lot of us feel that same way i just hope that you know that they understand that and like hey let's you know we, we know there's going to be a, a next season and that's the that's the concern is like like you said like we don't have enough time like is there really going to be a next season if they're aware of that then that makes me think like they have to be like we have to do this in 2025 and maybe 2025 is the deal breaker year. If they know this year is not going to be it. Yeah. I just, like I said, I, it's always, um, you know, you put this out and I don't, you know, if it's not up to, you know, there's all the, you know, if we put something out and it's subpar, we do the, 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 like, is there, are people engaged? You know, I saw, uh, we, I mean, I noticed that a lot with the USFL, the, you know, the 2022 season where they have all those eyeballs on the weekend and they have that truncated training camp and those games are really sloppy outside of the home, you know, the, the kind of the main kickoff one. And you saw viewership leg after that, because you come out, you know, this is your one, but you know, uh, like Heimbox, he'd say, you know, he feels you know confident and the teams are going and Curtis Johnson was on last week. I mean, he feels, you know, it, it seems like they feel that the teams are kind of up to speed here. You weren't to the screen images last weekend first off you know uh, fan interest wise i know it was raining how was that and then how was kind of the football stuff you saw you know it took a little bit i you know I, I made the comment to you guys at first like oh there's not a lot of people here so i was a little concerned like okay it's not the best weather but the rain held off a lot more fans started coming in around 9 30 10 o'clock and it was actually from a fan perspective there was a there was a lot of fans out there there was a, a couple hundred that were there and i think it was a really good turnout i think it was just as good of it ended up being just as good of a turnout as it was last year so one i was impressed with that two i will say the renegades practice this year that, that team looks like they're better than last year and i and i mean every team should be better they're, they've gotten you know when you cut half the, the the teams and you're inheriting all these good players like they do look you know, you should look better, but I will say like the returning players that are coming back for Arlington. Like I remember last year when I came on your show, I talked about, I had major concerns about the receiving core. I just didn't think they had enough playmakers this year. You got Tyler Vaughn's Javante Payton, who are back from last year. Both of them looked great. Isaiah uh, Winstead, who wasn't on the team last year, Isaiah looked great in practice. Like there is a lot of good receivers on the team. You know, that includes Sal Canella at tight end. Like this offense looks really stellar. Luis Perez was near perfect in practice. He looked really good. Offensive line just as strong as it's ever been. You know, Coach Highbox done a really good job with that offensive line. That's why he's, you know, always been considered the best offensive line coach, you know, in these spring leagues. But the offense looked good. The defense was solid. Like I, I feel like in general, this Renegades team is really put together better than they were last year. And I have a lot more confidence that they could play at a high level like they did late in the season last year. Do I think they're going to win the title? I, I mean, I, I don't think so. I think there's other teams that are stronger than them, but I do think this is a, this team is better than they were last year and they should be competitive. Well, it's interesting because like you said, you're getting uh, the consolidation of these teams, right? So we're kind of ch hand cherry picking the best players. And then also you do get some of this continuity now, right? Where we saw that with the USFL going from season one to two and, and just having that, you know, it, it's so hard to build that chemistry and you make training camp and do all that stuff. But, you know, it's halfway through the season before you're even, in, I mean, we even see that with NFL teams, right? And so the, the continuity of being able to come back, I, I think has to help, you know, and obviously there's kind of the, the mix and the, the roughnecks are kind of all that but you know in general you're kind of getting a lot of these guys back together well i think the one advantage the renegades have over i think any team in this league is coach stoops literally brought everyone back like everyone is back outside of the the you know the J jonathan hayes and tim blue you know tim lewis they're, they're they're not there anymore but everyone else is back so this is the same coaching staff they had last year i think it helps that you have someone like luis perez who was in this offense last year plus 
Luis Perez has played for like 5 million different teams and knows how to, you know, jump on a team, learn quickly and move on. So that, I mean, he's, I, I think he's one of the smartest quarterbacks in the spring leagues because he's had to be, he's been traded multiple times. He's bounced between teams and he's had to learn different offenses very quickly. And I think that gives him an advantage over most quarterbacks in this league. So I think when you, a lot of the players are back from last year, the majority of the team that won the championship is back outside of a few players. Like that, I think having that continuity is going to be an advantage for the Renegades because I think this is maybe one of the tighter knit teams in the league compared to the other seven. You're talking, you know, Luis coming back, right? That was a big, you know, big news. And Tiamu coming back, AJ McCarron, you know, besides the Matt Corral, like, it, you know, last year we kind of had some of the big names. Okay, we're bringing in and the Ben Kurtz of the world and all of that. Are you surprised we're kind of just doubling down with more of the homegrown talent, or is there any quarterback stuff that maybe I'm I'm missing without? I know the Roughnecks name there, uh, their starting quarterback, but you know, just uh, you always see these people. Oh, bring in Mansell, bring in. It seems like you know, hey, we got we got Luis Perez, we got these guys. They kind of know what they're doing. I mean, how many times have they tried to bring in a big name and then they do nothing? Like, I remember Brent Hundley came in last year and was like, oh, my God. You know, the rumors were he was the highest paid player in the XFL and he was going to be the star of this league for the Vipers. He ends up getting benched within like a week or two. Like, just just because they're a big name doesn't mean they're going to translate into having success. Now, do I think Matt Corral could do well with Birmingham? Absolutely. But, I mean, the, the reality is Jamar Smith. I mean, Coach Skip, uh, Skip Holtz talked about it a few weeks ago in the media availability. He said, Jamar Smith has been in his offense for seven years. Like, he's been with Skip Holtz in college. He's been with him with Birmingham. Jamar Smith knows the offense better than anybody else. So it, it's, a, it's a natural advantage for him to run this offense. He knows how to run it well, and he's, and he's done it to perfection because he's helped the team win a championship. You know, when he was the main starter in 2022. So, you know, just because you bring in big names doesn't mean that they're going to be an overnight success. I, to me, you know, and I know that there'll be a lot of this XFL, USFL kind of rivalry stuff, especially kind of the opening game, but I am worried that Birmingham might steamroll a lot of this stuff. Is that, and I know that, you know, practice it, you know, it's hard with all this training camp and we don't get the same access you would normally, but like just in terms of just, uh, the, like you said, the continuity there, how much they know everybody, we're bringing everybody back. You know, I know Scarborough retired, but like it just, it, it feels like that's a kind of a force to be reckoned with compared to maybe like the, the new look you know, roughnecks or whatever well I, I would say you know looking at the outlook of the, of each of the teams I, I i i'll be honest i think there's three really good teams that i feel like can win the championship that's birmingham dc and st louis i feel like there is a big separation between those three teams versus the rest of the league like i feel like maybe memphis and arlington are like right there in the middle at four and five like i think the two of them are going to battle for that last playoff spot but just what i see from you know, St. Louis, D.C., and Birmingham, those are the three teams I feel like they're going to dominate everybody in this league. And I feel like they're the three best teams, and they're going to battle it out for the for the, the, the championship. I feel like everyone else, you know, like Michigan, I mean, maybe E.J. Perry is the starting quarterback, but Michigan's offense is a mess. Like, they have a good defense, but I feel like they have no weapons offensively. So I'm, I think Michigan could end up being the worst team. San Antonio, there's so many you know, question marks that Wade Phillips has just come in there and just overhauled that whole roster to bring in a lot of roughnecks. But, you know, he didn't get all the top roughneck players. So it's like, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in San Antonio? Like, I, I feel like, you know, Memphis and um, Arlington, they're going to battle it out for that number four spot to see who's the fourth best team. But, I, you know, it, they're, they're, I think the only concern I have is there's a big separation between the yeah. top teams and then kind of the I don't want to say the bottom tier teams, but like the average teams. Well, it was right. It was Mike Mitchell the other day. We were talking that they had their scrimmage, the defenders, and I know Mike covers them and uh, like they just steamrolled, right? Was it Michigan they played, they scrimmaged against and it was like they just totally steamrolled them like it wasn't even close. And like you said, that that co-signs with kind of your assessment. But um, yeah, I you get that. And, and it, I, as good as this talent is in these groups, I mean, it still is, you know, it's still kind of spring football talent and pools we're trying to kind of work through here. But uh, it, with, with DC, uh, what is impressive? Seen you there, and and I mean, I assume Tamu right is kind of is going to be the star of that show. I know Abram Smith got hurt, so I don't know what they're going to do to kind of address that. I know they brought in some people, right? Yeah, I, I think the running back situation will be interesting in DC, but I, I but I, I think people got to remember this. Like, I'm not trying to knock on Abram Smith, but let's face it, he had like one game where he had over two, three hundred yards rushing against St. Louis, and then really the rest of the season, you look at his stats, and he was averaging like 
almost 50 yards a game. Like he wasn't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay his loss because it's a big, it is a big loss, but at the same time, like I, I look at someone like, you know, Mark Thompson with the Houston Roughnecks, he was a lot more consistent last year, averaging 70, 80, 90 yards a game. Like I'm looking for a running back like that versus, you know, someone like Abram Smith who had one big game. And then you look at the stats the rest of the season and it, it really wasn't that great. So I'm looking for someone that's a little more consistent, but I, I, yeah, DC is really put well together. I mean, they, they put, basically got the bunch back. Jordan Tiamu is one of the best quarterbacks in this league. Reggie Barlow has really coached a very disciplined defenders team and they, they put, you know, Vaughn Hutchins has really put a good roster together. So, I mean, you, you look at this defense, you look at the, the offense overall, like I, I think DC should be considered one of the best teams in this league. Yeah, and talking like you said, San Antonio, and that's kind of my team. And I, you know, I just obviously trust in Wade and AJ, but like I, I see like no buzz at all about San Antonio, like at all. It just doesn't even seem like anything's going on right now. I don't know. Uh, is it just because I don't know if the media people on some of these teams are pushing out more stuff, or I'm seeing more of it? But it, I, I don't sense a lot of <laughs> a lot of excitement around the San Antonio fan base right now, except for you know, there's some fan accounts that go for it. I, I think there's just so much uncertainty. Like we just don't know. This may be the team that I, I feel like is the most confusing because we just don't know like what we, we know what they're capable of. I mean, AJ Smith is you know one of the smartest offensive minds you know in all of spring football. But you know we we just don't know like what kind of team. I mean, we know we have John. They have Jonte Kirkland, who's one of the, was one of the best receivers in the XFL last year before his injury. Like we know he's got big play mentality to him, but. You know, they they haven't been named a starting quarterback yet. Like we don't, you know, the, the defense you know went through a major overhaul and the offense went through a major overhaul. So, the, the you're not going to really know what's going to come from the San Antonio team until maybe two three weeks into the season. Everyone else, you can kind of predict like where they're going to go. Like I think everyone kind of predicts you know Michigan's maybe one of the bottom teams. You know, you look at St. Louis and DC and Birmingham. Like those are op- the obvious top teams, but like San Antonio, like you're just shrugging your shoulder. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going to come for the team. You can expect good defense because Wade Phillips is a good defensive mind, but you know, outside of that, can AJ Smith, you know, be able to put this, you know, all these different pieces into this offense together and, you know, make the high flying offense that the Houston Roughnecks were last year. Um, yeah, because I'm looking at, you know, so I mean, is it going to be dormant? I know. And it's so hard. Cause like we, it's, it's basically like, preseason and training camp but like we don't know you know we're it's all like guessing and assumptions at this point but uh francois or dormady right i mean is that who we're rolling with with san antonio just see i i remember when they were doing kind of the initial drafts like oh they're gonna bring in someone or they're gonna get ben or whatever it just doesn't seem like they've ever like that's that's who we're rolling with i mean it could be i i, I would think dormady would be the favorite i mean just because he he came in last year everything that he went through with orlando and it was able to be one of the top quarterbacks in this league. So I, 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 it feels like that it should be him. I mean, Francois, I mean, no, I don't, I don't really see him being in the running uh, chase. I think chase Garbers is still on the team as well. Like he could be in the running, but I think Quentin Dormady is the one that I, I think should be at least the favorite to win the job. But, you know, then again, everyone thought Reese Sinnott was going to win the, the Houston Roughnecks job and Jared ended up winning that job. So I guess you never really know until they, they set the depth chart up. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. I have your article here that you, them naming Mark Thompson kind of a lot of a lot of flux right now. We had Curtis Johnson on last week. And what do you make of them uh, naming Jared as a starting quarterback? You know, he has a lot of upside. He's got good size uh, for a quarterback. You know, I, I think he's got a, a strong arm and. You know, I, I think what they really like about him and from my understanding is they love his potential. They love his upside. You know, they, the if you're a Houston Gamblers fan, you've spent the last two years trying to go through an influx of quarterbacks. You know, you had Clayton Thorson in 2022 and he was all right, but he wasn't great. Then he got hurt and Kenji Barhar came in there and you saw the potential with Kenji Barhar, you know, being that he was with the Baltimore Ravens, like, oh, maybe you could be the next Lamar Jackson. And, you know, last year he got up to a hot start and then he got it, he got that ankle injury against the Philadelphia Stars and then his season kind of fell apart. And then they ended up moving on from him uh, during training camp. So I think they're looking, I, I think Coach Johnson wants to have a more of a prototype quarterback that fits the bill, you know, tall, long stature, strong arm. And I think Jarrett's got that. And, you know, he had some success with Tennessee. It wasn't always smooth with the volunteers, but he's got the potential to be a really good quarterback. And 
Um, he's got weapons. I mean, Justin Hall was one of the best receivers in the USFL last year. So he, he's got the weapons on offense and, you know, hope, you know, for the Roughnecks offense, you, you hope that Mark Thompson can, you know, be ready for week one. I mean, this, this guy was the USFL offensive player of the year last year, for the last two years, he's been one of the top five running backs in, you know, spring football. So the Roughnecks really need him to be back. Otherwise, you know, they can go with TJ Pleasure, who, you know, he he came in last year to fill in for Mark Thompson when he was out with um, a couple of weeks with an injury and Pleasure is a, a solid running back. But Mark Thompson is a difference maker. He can, you know, catch out of the backfield and he can just run you over. So, you know, they they certainly have to hope that they can get Thompson back. Yeah, uh, uh, UFL Twitter certainly runs through Mark Thompson's fingers right now and his <laughs> keyboard. Um, was he was he he was complaining about like the field or the turf? I'm like, do we okay, do we need to get into all this right? Like, I don't, you know, this isn't the Cashman Field scenario. Like, let's, you know, I mean, they're playing on like high school, right? I mean, they're playing on like this is shouldn't be an issue, right? Yeah, I mean, he, I, I think he made the comment like Arlington's field is the worst or something like that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know, like what the field is made of i don't know you know how, how it's all set up but you know injuries happen and you know unfortunately mark thompson you know had an in, you know he was injured last year so i, I don't want to say he's injury prone but this is the second time he's been hurt in two years so i mean there 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 is you know that part of his game you know he put he plays a physical position at running back so he takes a lot of hits and he has to make a lot of cuts and stuff like that so Injuries are a natural part of the game. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going to be something that he'll be out for the season for because they haven't placed him on, on the injured reserve list yet. You know, at least uh, from this recording, they haven't done it yet. So I, it feels like, he, you know, if he is going to miss time, it doesn't seem like it's going to be too much. So hopefully he'll be back sooner rather than later. Um, I have it here. The, the Arlington, right there, they finalized today. They're kind of ahead of the curve. Some of the teams you know, have to Saturday to do it. Any surprises on that? Because I remember... Um, who was I talking to? One of the recent interviews about just you know the the line of uh, you don't feel necessarily safe. Where maybe last season you're sitting okay, I'm gonna I look around and I can see the talent, but where the talent level so high on some of these teams, you know we're really kind of nitpicking to get this cut down. Uh, any surprises with the Arlington cuts? Um, Devin Darrington was a, a big surprise. You know he he took him and uh, Devion Smith were they were splitting the carries um, last Saturday when I went to their open practice. So I, I kind of just assumed that maybe he was going to be the backup running back. I mean, it's Debbie on Smith's job. He, 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 he fits what, you know, Bob Stoop wants in a running back in his offense. So I thought it made sense for, you know, him to start and Devin Darrington to be the backup, but you know, with Devin being released, I, I think it's probably going to be Letty Brown probably being his backup again. He was the backup late last year for them and he performed pretty well in that role with uh, Debbie on Smith. So I'm going to assume Letty Brown probably comes in. I know uh, Stoops likes uh, Dede Hunter, who is the third running back on the roster. So, um, I mean, Hunter could be seeing some playing time as well. Um, really, other than that, I mean, Christian Sam, I know he was placed on the suspended list, but uh, he was a guy who played well in the USFL uh, last year, and I, I thought maybe he could make an impact on this linebacking course. So, yeah, I, I don't know what happened with the suspension. I, I, nothing's been really said about that, but with him being placed on that list yesterday, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise, but at the same time, he's a talented linebacker, and you know, whatever the suspension is, if he can, if another U UFL team can pick him up and bring him on their team, I think he could be an impactful player. But really, I think the big one was Devin Darrington. That that was a that was a, a very surprising move because he's so versatile. And that was a, a, I don't know if it was a hit on the offense because I think Letty Brown can come in there and be that versatile back they need. But that was a surprising cut. Uh, how uh, how is Coach Stoops? Uh, does he seem to be enjoying the process this time around? I mean, you know, I mean, he's the one right. His wife doesn't want him at home or whatever. I mean, does he seem to be enjoying this? I I know he he brings this up a lot of the times where he's that people are asking him, you know, how, how are you enjoying? It? He's like, hey, I don't have to go to like compliance meetings. I don't have to deal with parents or anything like that. I don't have to deal with grades. Like these are adults. You know, I don't have to worry about them. They you know they're adults. They come into work when they need to. They do what they need to do, and then they they go off on their own. So I think he enjoy. I think the schedule fits him perfectly because, you know, he's going to work, you know, for a few months here, then, you know, he's basically off for the rest of the year and he could do his job, you know, from wherever he wants to. So I, I think it, he, the last couple of years, I've seen a difference in him from 2020. I think 2020, he was just a little more serious about it because this was basically his first professional job. And it seems like he wanted to be, 
you know, really good at it. Now, I think heading into 2023 and 2024, he seems to be a little more relaxed, really enjoying, um, you know, the moment of being a head coach. And I think helping the championship last year really helped because I'm sure it gives him the confidence and gives his team the confidence needed that they can come in here and, you know, try to repeat as champions. Yeah, a lot of pressure on that, you know, and I Bach, I was photoshopping photos of them with the, you know, with the trophy to get ready for the episode. And, you know, it, it, uh, targets on your back, you know, and I think I know they take a lot of pride in that and being able to do that and, you know, how they how the season turned out for them last year. So a lot of pressure on that. Uh, any other stories, any other tidbits before we get out of here? Uh, I know, well, like I said, we'll, we'll convene here next week before the kickoff and all of that. But uh, any other things you're tracking right now? Um, the one thing I'm interested with the Renegades is how they use Lindsay, Lindsay Scott. I know uh, when Mike and I were on the uh, media availability last week, he had asked about Lindsay Scott and Stoops had said that, that there could be some packages for him. We'll see. He tried to keep it as vague as possible, but it really does seem like they may use him. M- my assumption is they're going to use him very similar to how they used Kelly Bryant last year and how they have some packages where he may be just running the ball or he could be rolling out. I will say when I saw from Lindsey Scott in practice, he looked solid. I-, I think, you know, at the beginning, there were some times where he was trying to force deep balls and he was trying to force passes and double coverage. But uh, I will say when he rolls out of the pocket, he is very accurate with the football. So I wouldn't be surprised if they used him for some, you know, RPO style plays, maybe rolling him out of the pocket on, you know, play action. He could be very good for that. So I'm really interested to see if Lindsey Scott gives his offense a little more creativity and be able to, you know, use his ability to run the football. Well, and obviously with the new, you know, offensive coordinator and stuff as well. You know, I know that last year you were a little lament about, you know, some of the, the a little bit more in Arlington offense. So maybe this time around it could be a little bit more exciting that way. But yeah, different, different quarterback than Perez. So it's exciting to see. But, you know, you can't doubt Luis while you have it. So I, I guess he'll just ride it out here and we'll have to see. He's the spring football king. I mean, we, we all know it. I mean, he's, he's been in the, been in a million of these leagues and he's been successful every time. So, um, I'm, I'll be interested to see if this is his last go around or if he's going to continue doing this. But I mean, if I was him, I would keep rolling with it because he's been one of the top quarterbacks in these leagues. Well, Anthony, uh, enjoy uh, the week here. Uh, we'll see you in, in Texas next week. I'm sure we'll have a Shiner Bach or two here after the game. Uh, enjoy your uh, clean shaven uh, Jalen Hurts quarterback and your tiny hands, Kenny Pickett. Uh, we'll we go, you know, we'll go get Drake May or something, and uh, it should be exciting. I think the NFC East is going to be exciting this year. They're talking about the Cowboys or Matt at Dak Prescott. I think lots of excitement there with Daniel Jones and everything else. Yeah, it should be smooth sailing for the Eagles to win that division. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Anthony Miller, uh, like I said, check him out. Sports Illustrated, everything else. Uh, the hardest working man on there, except him and Mike Mitchell. So really appreciate it. Uh, have a good night. Thanks. Appreciate it. Huge special thanks for everybody, all the work it took to get the episode together today. A shout out Jeff, everybody over at the UFL, getting the Daryl Johnson interview set up means a lot. I know there's lots of spinning plates and things in motion, so means a lot. You guys setting that up, Daryl taking the time to come on, uh, busy guy getting ready for the season, you know, talking, getting the league going here uh, in less than two months. So means a lot, certainly appreciated. Thank you to Bianca, everybody over at the uh, Arlington Renegades, getting Coach Heimbach set up again, him coming on on the weekend, taking time on a Sunday morning before you know, God knows all the stuff he's working on. So uh, thank you, Coach Heimbach. Shout out as well, his five is one uh, offensive line training and then his podcast. And with that being said, you know, Coach Heimbach is a, is a fellow a football content creator. So I always want to make sure we get that shouted out. I'll put the links in the description. Uh, thank you very much. And then, like I said, Anthony Miller here taking time to come on uh, all the work and articles and the endless supply of things that he's providing right now content wise with him and Mike Mitchell over at Sports Illustrated. So means a lot. We'll try to get Anthony, I think, involved next week as well with the kickoff episode. But we certainly enjoy kind of the, the, the sit down and deep dive that we're able to do on this, uh, you know, this format here. Uh, Like I said, that'll do it for me today. Like and subscribe. Big UFL kickoff episode next week, live from Texas. I'll post during the week, but if you're you know subscribed on here, turn on the bells, kind of all that stuff, you'll get the notifications, and then I'll be posting everything on Facebook and Twitter. But should be a good guest list. Should be a lot of fun. Like I said, we it's not the first rodeo with all this stuff. So and then uh, stay tuned. Like I said, the the weekly UFL recaps here coming out uh, during the season. So hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks again. Take care.